from the University of Lausanne and became member of the Swiss Association of Actuaries. In 1969, he launched the leading medical group plans in Lebanon and the Arab world. Between 1974 and 1987, and due to the war in Lebanon, he was active in the formation of four insurance companies outside Lebanon. Between 1987 and 2007, he became CEO of Alliance Na, the, the leading insurance group in Lebanon. He is also a board member of the Hotel Dieu Hospital in Lebanon, the National Social Security Fund of Lebanon. He is advisory board member at AUB, American University of Beirut, and member of the advisory board for the business school at LAU, Lebanese American University. Please help me to welcome Mr. Antoine Wakim. Good morning. Good morning. It seems that you had a tough day yesterday in, uh, in this part of uh, the, high, the valley of Kadisha. I hope that you recovered from uh, this uh, long trip. I will try to go into a kind of uh, idea which is, why should we, Lebanese, particularly the third and second and fourth generation, be proud of this country? Because my family, where my father, they were 10, between Brazil, United States, Norway today, France, Switzerland, and Lebanon. And I noticed that every time I go there, particularly the third generation in Brazil, they always say, what is your origin, basically? They are a little bit confused. Are they Brazilians from origin? It's difficult. So I have developed this, some thinking, which I would like to share with you. First, it's important to know the history of this country, which I am sure that you went through it. But I have 10 major arguments. Why should we be proud being of Lebanon? The most terrible thing is not to say or to try to camouflage, as we say in French, to hide the origin by saying, you cannot be a French. The British does have an address. He can say London. The Israeli today, they are building up after 2,000 years, Palestine. The Palestinians, they fought for the last 50, 60 years to recover their lands. But everyone does have an address. Our address in Lebanon, why should be proud of this address? I have developed 10 ideas, which I would like to share with you. These 10 are not limited to 10, but they have these arguments. There are many, but these are the 10 basic arguments which I think I share with you, I would like to share with you. The first one is, it's, it's not military. The history of the Maronites is not military. It's basically based on faith and culture. The first uh, basic point is that 100 years ago, exactly 100 years ago, one third of the Christians of the mountain was decimated by the terrible starvation imposed by the Ottomans which you will see through the film today, I hope that it's going to be fixed, which is decimated one third of the Christian of the mountains. And in spite of this, this 
starvation operation, which was terrible, was behind the willingness and the obsession of the Christians to have a nation in this Arab world, and we created, and Lebanon was created. This is number one. Number two, I am sure that you know that the first, first, absolutely first contact between the culture of the West and the culture of this part of the Middle East and the Arab world was the, the, the Maronite school in Rome, founded in 1584. 1584 was the first link, cultural link, between the West and the East, between the Arab world and the West. And the Maronites were the first to take out from this part of the world cultural values transmitted to the West and get from the West through Lebanon cultural values and transmitted to the Arab world. This is a major point that only Christian Lebanese was behind it. Number two, just mark this date in your mind, 1736. The first school ever in the world, compulsory, was created in Lebanon in 1736 in Loisie, in a little village, which is not far from here, about five kilometers, where the Christians, monas uh, Christian church, the Maronite church, decided to open schools and create schools in all the mountains and Beirut in 1736 and made of the schools a compulsory fact. This is second unique element in the hist history of this part of the world and sometimes compared to the world. Three, I think that you, you have been visited, the first printing machine ever entered in the Arab world yesterday. I don't know if you are aware that the first political newspapers, the first political issues was written by the Lebanese in the modern history in 1860s, where they have been forced to move from Lebanon because of these massacres in 1860 to Cairo. The 10 of the newspapers at that time in Cairo was founded by Christian Lebanese. They were behind the, what we call, la renaissance, which is, it's behind what we call in the Arab, the awakeness of the Arab world and the culture was done by the Lebanese in 1860. What happened in 1860 is exactly the fruit of these schools founded in 1736. Seven years ago, the first fruit of these schools was the Lebanese culture who have been able to move into the Arab world. In 1867, 867, the first university, medical university in the Arab world, inspired and directed by Harvard. Imagine in 1867, which was the American University in Beirut, which was followed later on by the University of Saint Joseph. 1914, Beirut was, which is a tiny village compared to Cairo, was editing as much newspaper as Cairo in terms of, of political and open-minded approach. In spite of 400 years of Ottoman Empire, I would like to mention to you this citation, citation of an Orientalist which have the name Churchill, not the Churchill that you have studied uh, in the UK, but he was a big uh, Orientalist. He wrote this in 1853, 1853, 150 years ago, about Lebanon and Mount, Mount Lebanon. He said, nature and the influence of events have combined to make Mount Lebanon on what it has long been and must always continue to be the rampart and fortress of religious liberty in the East. And at a later period, for those sectarians who were exposed to fury and persecution of the dominant faith and doctrine of Constantinople. Imagine in 1853, what we've in our modern history, a people of my age, we have al already witnessed the Ar in, at the in, uh, beginning of the century, Lebanon welcomed the Armenians during the big massacres. 
in 48 Lebanon welcomed the Palestinians. We welcomed the Christians of Egypt in the 60s. And today we are the only country who is welcoming about 1.3 million Syrians, which is 30% of its population. And I don't know if you feel it. Do you feel that there is a struggle in the country? We have been able to welcome one. Imagine that if a Brazil or any country where you are living, one third of your population is coming from one day to another to, uh, to stay as a refugees. The nature of this country, the nature of its land and the nature of its people permit this kind of phenomenon, which I believe was <laughs> discovered by Mr. Churchill in 1853. I, be, I believe that in 19, th th we will see the film and you will see exactly what are the consequences and the damages that this starvation, which hit all the Christians in Lebanon and also was a part of the Ottoman Empire policy to decimate the Christians. They started by the, by the Armenians and all the Christians in the Arab world. It's very important to know. This is a simple of what's happened to the Christians who were populating this part of the of this uh, world. We are still living in a magical, absolutely equilibrium in this country. If you look to the map, it's not easy to discover how much we are tiny compared to the vast area which is populated by non-Christians and by a desert. If you take off on a plane from Dubai, and you come to Lebanon, you look on from the window, it's desert. The only green, really, area is in Lebanon in part of Syria. And it is why the Christians came from most probably desert to live here. And they built in the knowledge, la connaissance. Today, if you look to bury the presence of the Lebanese around the world, you will notice that we have excellent people to represent us. You have Carlos Slim in South Africa, South America. You have Carl, Carlos Rosen. I think those who are do, uh, doing business, business school do know that who's Carlos Rosen. He's a magician, Carlos Rosen. He's the only man, I think, who could have been able to make a kind of combination between the French imaginary approach and the way the, the Japanese do things, like the Germans. He saved Nissan and turned Renault and Nissan into one of the largest uh, 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 number three in the world, which was bankrupt. You know Hayek, who do know that Swatch, it's a Lebanese behind. He saved the Swiss. My wife, she is Swiss. When you say in Switzerland that I am Lebanese, those who know about the industry, they tell you that the Swiss industry was really saved by Hayek. We have the only population in this Arab world who produced two Nobel Prizes in medicine and famous two of them. Peter Mdawar. We have certainly in the art, but in terms of science, we have great people. If you look to what's happened in the States, those of you remember today who know what, what is consumer, defense du consommateur, to defend the consumer. Who created? Nader in the States. And he was candidate to be to the president of the republic. Just to go through all this, I invite you to read a book, which I will communicate the name to Madame Bustani. This book is a bestseller, wrote by a, a, a PhD in the States and who became a bestseller. This book wrote about four populations in the world. He said that there are only two populations in modern history that made conquers, conquerants. They enlarged their scope in terms of land, in terms of influence, without a single shot. These four peoples are the Jews, which you find them everywhere, the Chinese, you find them everywhere, the Lebanese, mainly Christians, and the Armenians. And you look in this book what they have achieved, the Lebanese. They are everywhere, in every land, all over the world. They have built up enterprises, firms, 
but they never killed anyone. They fought by knowledge. And all this, my ladies and gentlemen, they are the fruits of 1736 school opening. This knowledge which was built by the Christians, 1736, is behind everything in this country. It's behind our uh, recent resistance. It's behind, we have survived because of knowledge to a terrible war of 20 years between 1975 to 1995. Without knowledge, we wouldn't have been, all of us, here. Today, because of knowledge, Lebanon and the Christians, we do have the best universities in the Arab world, by far the best universities. We have the best schools. We have the best hospitals. We have the best network of knowledge. We have the best lawyers, the best doctors, the best engineers all over the world. If you put a lamp on the head of the Lebanese expatriate in this part of the world, and you put a satellite, and in the e one night where there's no light moon, you will see that you are everywhere, in command everywhere, because of knowledge. Knowledge is what created by the church, and which is the real power animating our genetically, because genetically we are prepared to resist. We are, I would like to compare the Lebanese to, if we have to compare them, you have a choice between compare them to a fish or to eagle. When you have a little land, like 10,000 500 kilometers, like a little state anywhere, Bolivia or Brazil, anywhere you are, 10,500, overpopulated, terribly encountered by hostilities. These 10,400, Michel she has said about those people living in, that the, Christ the Lebanese, they are born with wings. They cannot be a fish. Because take an aquarium, put a fish in it. It could be a nice fish. But once he's big, you cannot enlarge him for, um, uh, the aquarium. It's limitation for, uh, for the aquarium. We are limited by 10,500 square meter. So what you do, you take the fish, you put in a river, any fish coming will take it. While if you are an eagle, you have a nest, you fly, you create nest. And if in a world where there is no borders anymore, we are the first who went, went into mondialization. We are the pioneer of mondialization. In a world where there is no borders, we are the champions. We are still the champions. 80% of our young people, they are w acting worldwide. So these are some ideas. Why should we be free? We should not lie. We should tell our origins. And we should say why we are proud of being of this part of the world and being particularly Christian or Maronite of this part of the world. I will not develop more this, my, uh, my uh, words, because I would like to give space to this film, which was developed by, a, uh, by CMDR, the Maronite Center of Research and Center, and, and worked out by Madame uh, Yvonne Khoury, which I give her the ground to, uh, to, to develop this uh, with you. But I would like to terminate by saying this to you as a friend. Frail roots lead to frail trees. Strong roots lead to strong trees. No roots, nowhere. Don't imagine that we can live by not by forgetting our past. Our past is a genuine past. It's the fruit of 1,600 years of fighting and about 300 years in the desert and in the Arab world before reaching what you m where, where you were yesterday in Kadesh. Lebanon is your address. Keep it in your mind. Keep these arguments in your mind. Add to the other arguments because soon or later, when you reach my age or even younger, you will need to tell a story to your children or your grandchildren. You will need to have arguments. Keep them in your mind. Thank you. Bless God. Bless. God bless you.
Well, good morning. My name is Yolande Khouri, and uh, I'm a TV journalist. I prepared uh, this documentary. It's an 18 minute documentary. And I'm very glad, I'm very happy indeed to share this documentary uh, today with you. Uh, actually, I'm going to share not a documentary, but memories. Said memories, it's true, but they are real memories. And those memories are about our ancestors. Your ancestors, my ancestors, and we are, we are proud to know what they suffer. They suffered a lot. They suffered starvation. They suffered uh, humiliation. They suffered oppression and many other things, and you will see now. But uh, I would like to tell you that it's very important. The most important thing is to know our history. Because if everybody knows the history of his ancestors, the world would be different. So please, read your history. And unfortunately, this part of the history, of the Lebanese history, was really ignored and neglected in the history book in our schools, unfortunately. And that's why we are trying today to, to give this documentary, like a, not a documentary, but a document for all the generations. Our ancestors suffered because they wanted freedom, they wanted peace, and they wanted justice. And they were not allowed to live with freedom, peace, and justice. I will leave you now with this documentary, and I hope you will appreciate it. Thank you. Written and the hidden pages which remained white shall be filled with lines of truth and words that will do the deceased justice and protect those who will follow. If we really of our nation. No one dies of hunger. This is a sentence that we unthinkingly repeat because, because we simply never really experienced. But the truth is, many people, people close to us, people who passed before us here in our villages, our homes of our own flesh and blood, our parents, our ancestors, them, they died of hunger. Starving to death is not a heroic deed, but these people were heroes. They were heroes whose thin bodies got buried in this land and whose blood was mixed with the soil that flourished with abundances for their grandchildren and descendants, so they can be blessed by a nation that is not dominated by a stranger nor conquered by an invader. On November 3rd, 1914, Turkey became an official participant in the war and Jamal Pasha was nominated governor of Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. Thus, under the pretext of allocating wheat to the 4th Army, which was under his authority, in order to execute the campaign of Suez Canal, he enforced a land blockade on Mount Lebanon and stopped the delivery of provisions to be taken in from neighboring countries. In addition, he requisitioned all transportation means and livestock of the individuals in order to put them at the disposal of his army. Lebanon is cut from the world. On land, the Ottomans imposed a blockade, and by sea, 
Allied forces imposed a blockade on the coasts extending from Egypt to Lebanon up to Turkey in order to put pressure on the Ottoman Empire. On the other hand, the independency of the province of Mount Lebanon, as well as its privileges, were in contradiction with the ideology of the Ottoman state, as well as the Turanian totalitarian doctrine, which was against any liberal thinking different from their doctrine. Given the facts, the solution resided in the weakening of the inhabitants of Mount Lebanon and the abolition of any possibility of rebellion against the Ottoman authority and consequently cutting any Western intervention aiming for their protection, which resulted in fact in the elimination of people through oppression and famine. However, the idea of freedom survived. The trio Jamal Pasha, Anwar Pasha, and Talat Pasha did not care about eliminating the minorities. Rather, they aimed to apply the pan-Turkism on all the inhabitants of the empire. Proof given is their fight against the Armenian, the Arab Muslims partisans of Amir Faisal, and the inhabitants of Mount Lebanon, as well as every person who dared calling for independence. Starvation was the high cost that the inhabitants of Mount Lebanon had to pay for having claimed freedom. The inhabitants of Mount Lebanon suffered from the system of terror which pictured the victims as traitors in order to justify the torture they have been subjected to. Thus, the system applied all kinds of oppression, such as imposing the forced labor, but the most unfair were the verdicts rendered by the martial court established by Jamal Pasha in Alay. Many were condemned to exile in Anatolia. As for those who escaped hanging, they were thrown in dark prisons. These measures were not enough to Jamal Pasha. So in order to tighten the noose on the inhabitants, he ordered to cut all forests and fruit trees under the pretext of ensuring wood for the Turkish army. Even mulberry trees used for silk farming were cut. Thus, he eliminated the main source of living of the inhabitants of Mount Lebanon. With the imposition of land and sea blockades, the exportation of silk into foreign countries was stopped. No more silk for exportation, no more money, hence starvation. As if the catastrophe of Jamal Pasha was not enough, the catastrophe of crickets that appeared on April 1915 made things worse, and the invasions were renewed during nine months after. The crickets aggravated the tragedy. The narrow and rough lands were barely adequate to feed a small number of families in Mount Lebanon, which suffered from a lack of self-sufficiency. The craving hunger was now a fatal famine, particularly in the villages of the Middle Mountains. Malnutrition and the lack of hygiene weakened people's bodies. Their immune system was destroyed, and diseases and epidemics such as cholera, malaria, typhoid, and many others attacked everyone. But the most lethal of all was the typhus. There were no more medicines, and the physicians and pharmacists of the province were in their majority compelled to enlist in the Ottoman army. Some physicians mentioned that they treated young people whose bodies were like those of the old, and patients who looked like phantoms haunting the roads. The blood circulating in their veins was transformed into plasma. The disease isolated them. They were facing slow death. Lebanon, as described at the time, was like a large theater where many death scenes were played every day. Dogs and rats meat, as well as dead bodies, were considered fine meals. What is this hunger that makes a father or a mother eat their perished children? Misery hit hard and despair exacerbated. The collective cemeteries were full of dead bodies. Some people were even buried alive before exhaling their last breath. Heartbroken and in deep pain, Gibran Khalil Gibran shouted from the land of immigration, dead are my people. They died because they were peacemakers. 
They perished from hunger in a land rich with honey. They died because the vipers and sons of vipers spat out poison into the space where the holy cedars and the roses and the jasmine breathed their fragrance. Jamal Pasha tried to hide the news of methodic starving he put into execution in order to avoid provoking the international public opinion. But truth was stronger than he was. Father Boulos Khwede went back to Egypt after his investigation mission in Mount Lebanon and broke the isolation imposed on the province. He published articles about the prevailing misery and wrote in his report, as far as historians may exaggerate in describing this war, they will only be able to sketch the shadow of reality. The Western and the Arab media revealed the plan of Jamal Pasha and accusations were addressed against the Ottoman authority. Facing the situation, the butcher was furiously mad. He forced the patriarch Ilyas Hwayik by pressure and house arrest to sign a text discharging him from the famine and crimes committed in Mount Lebanon. Later, Jamal Pasha established an illusionary rescue plan that consists in founding the new Lebanese company for wheat. As a result, the Turks and some Lebanese who were responsible for the offices of wheat's distribution in the regions made big fortunes. Opportunist merchants, monopolists, and usurers exploited the famine reality. Nothing seemed to affect their cold hearts, not even the scene of a child eating his shoes because they are made of animal leather, nor that of a girl devouring garbage. The exorbitant food prices forced people to sell all their properties, lands, farms, and houses. After gold was used for payment, utensils, clothes, and furniture went missing piece by piece. Even windows, doors, and roof tiles were used to pay for food. Some died in silence because they wouldn't let themselves reach out and beg for food. Others sold their bodies to stay alive. The worst were those who sold their conscience. Well, the survival instinct was stronger than values and morals. Famine and oppression made the proud and dignified people humiliated. The most precious goods were sold for a piece of fruit or a loaf of bread. A loaf of hard black bread similar to the ongoing days on this land. A loaf of bread for which the wheat was mixed with the sand, weed, and even sometimes with the toxic Santorini substance. Bread that carried disease and sometimes death instead of giving life. Many villages were deserted and all their inhabitants were displayed or died of hunger, according to the remaining registers. Towards this black painting of death and oppression, the resounding shout of Patriarch Ilyas Hwayek soared, Lord, have mercy, have mercy on your people. Patriarch Hwayek called the church and the believers to resort to the Virgin Mary. While Portugal was witnessing the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima in 1917, Mount Lebanon was bleeding and raising to the sky a canticle which told the misery of starvation touched the hearts of the Heavenly Mother. This canticle touched the heart and was registered in the Maronite liturgy up to this day. Patriarch Hwayik opened the doors of Kirki for the people, and Kirki became a center for the distribution of food and subventions. 
he mortgaged all the properties of Pkirke and sold all the oil and silk owned by the Patriarchate. He organized the distribution of subventions and the diocese of the regions. Moreover, he ordered the Maronite congregations to borrow funds, even if with high interest rates, and to sell their properties in case they find a buyer, in order to ensure the wheat price and to provide shelter and assistance for the patients. The Congregation of St. Saviour and the Congregation of St. Paul were dedicated to charity. Meanwhile, the Ottomans were invading some convents and schools and expelling the monks. The clerks of all rites in Lebanon and neighboring countries carried out great acts of mercy, such as the Orthodox and the Catholic Syriac Patriarchs, Bishop Yusuf Dirian and Bishop Antun Arida, who converted the convent in Karm Sedde into an orphanage for children and sold his diamond-studded cross to take care of them. The vulnerable father Bshara Abu Murad dedicated himself to help people in need, as did blessed father Ya'ub the Capuchin, who was persecuted by the Turks who tried to exile him. Father Ernest Sarlut, superior general of Antura school, was expelled from Lebanon by the Ottoman authorities because of the aids he provided. The Jesuit fathers suffered a lot from the Ottoman harassment because France was an ally in the war. These priests were displayed from their convents. As for those who stayed, they did their best to shelter people in need and to attend to their injuries. Benefactors in Lebanon belong to all confessions. For instance, a large number of Sunnite families in Beirut, such as Daouk, Kronfol, Tabara, Fakhouri families, and others, offered a helping hand. The most prominent between them was Omar Daouk, who opened 12 free restaurants and six shelters, as well as tailoring institutions to ensure job opportunities for women. In Tripoli, Hash Hussein Awaida was distinguished for his good deeds, and in the South, Yusuf Zain. In parallel, the American government offered a large contribution, mainly the American University of Beirut and the Protestant missions, who distributed wheat, money, and clothes. They also opened free restaurants and charitable associations in Beirut and in Kisarwan. The most prominent role carried out by the Americans was that they facilitated the transfer of money from Lebanese immigrants in the U.S. to their relatives in Mount Lebanon, despite the land and sea blockades. In addition, the French as well as the Apostolic Nunciature passed the transfers of donations through Arwad Island and distributed them in secret coordination with the Maronite Patriarchate through Father Bulo Sa'el and Pshara Bwede to avoid being caught by the Turks. Had these contributions not taken place, the number of victims would have been at least double what it was. The war ended. Jamal Pasha, the butcher, left Lebanon. The Ottoman Empire collapsed. Mount Lebanon was covered in black, mourning the loss of more than 200,000 of its inhabitants who died of starvation. It is true that the majority of the victims were Christians but the famine also reaped victims of other confessions. The mortality rate, which increased at the end of the war, according to the census, is terrifying relatively to the initial number of inhabitants of Mount Lebanon. In order to prevent having another blockade and deprivation, Patriarch Hawaii demanded the independence of Mount Lebanon during the Reconciliation Conference and the restitution of the anterior geographical frontiers, people do not like to remember the dark days they experienced and would rather delete these memories because they do not like to talk about the failure and humiliation they lived. However, what happened is a real historical tragedy and it is necessary to read it objectively to draw lessons the starvation of Mount Lebanon did not get the importance it deserves among history stories. It should not remain a pending case which features and interpretation are blurry unclear. Therefore, it is necessary to reconcile with the past in order to be able to build the future. A mistake is never corrected if ignored. 
A sin is not forgiven unless confessed. It is only then that we can forgive without forgetting and talk without being afraid, so that these vows would only toll for joy, so that the soil of this land does not embrace any hungry, oppressed, or defeated person, so that the future generations that will live under this sky may never be exploited or oppressed by anyone and may never experience the monopolization or contempt. For all these reasons, and in honor of those who suffered, as well as those who helped and made sacrifices, history shall be written, and the hidden pages which remained white shall be filled with lines of truth and words that will do the deceased justice and protect those who will follow, if we really love our nation.